Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for craftworldeldar.com. I'm Brent, and in this video I am going to show you how to get the most out of fire dragons in competitive play if you're a Craft Worlds player. So fire dragons, I think, are one of the coolest aspect warriors. They have great lore. The models look really good. They've, even though they're older models, I think they've they've aged well, better than better than a lot of stuff in the game. And in theory, they should be one of the most powerful infantry units available to Eldar, right? Every single model in the unit has this powerful fusion gun, which is this anti-tank, anti-monster weapon. It's actually got a better profile than the Bright Lance, and so they should be amazing. Uh, they were in, in 8th edition and early 9th edition, they were not amazing. Uh, they're just too expensive and too fragile. Everything is different now because in early 2021, there was an FAQ that made it possible to fire and fade uh, into a transport. So fire dragons now can do this. And you might be thinking to yourself, Brent, why do I need a video showing me how to fire and fade? I can do that, right? It's actually, so doing this effectively is actually more complex than it initially sounds. And if you're a fan of my website and my blog, you may already have read my article uh, about how to use fire dragons in this way. And if you are feeling grumpy, I, I understand, but I am going to, to mention some tips on how to do this in the video uh, and some additional complexities that I don't go into in that article. So there will be some new content here for you. And uh, when I published that article, I think back in February, I got a bunch of emails from people saying, uh, can you do videos? I was actually already working on the, the YouTube channel. And so I, I put this on the list of things that I, I planned to make a video about, but a few people specifically said, you know, it's one thing to read it, but it would be easier if you could just show me what it is you mean. So, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, what you need to do this is a wave serpent and 10 fire dragons. And you might be thinking 10, really? That's a lot. Uh, there are variants for this, right? So you can, you can run this with fewer fire dragons. You can run it with eight, uh, it, it potentially will work just as well. And you can also run seven with five Dire Avengers. You can run six in a Falcon. And later in the video, I will talk about those variant builds. But for now, let's talk 10 Fire Dragons. This is my favorite one of these builds. I don't know if it's the most optimal, but it is the one that I prefer because with 10 Dragons, you can really count on what I'm about to show you working effectively to eliminate a hard target. And this is just, I guess, maybe an eccentricity of how I personally play, but I have extremely low tolerance for gambling on my uh, unit elimination units. So any, any unit that is in my army specifically for target elimination, I'm very conservative about, about the math. I want to be able to count on them eliminating what it is I intend for them to eliminate, even if I roll poorly. Uh, and so I like the big squad of dragons. Again, I, I don't know whether it's Totally optimal, but this is the one I'm going to show you first. So, Wave Serpent, 10 Dragons. The Wave Serpent, I would advise you running the most basic serpent. So, throw a couple of uh, Shuriken Cannons on there. I think Shuriken Cannons are the best for a serpent because if it is advancing, right, you can still fire with them. And frankly, Wave Serpents, for the most part, they you need to be focused on positioning them with reference to what's inside of them, not in, in with uh, an eye towards using their heavy weapons on anything in particular. And because they do, they tend to get shot up a bit. They they may end up firing on a declining profile even when it is they even when they do have a target. And so I just I don't think that they're good chassis for expensive heavy weapons like uh, bright lances and star cannons and, and AMLs. I, I think you're better off putting those on other other tanks. So basic loadout. Uh, 10 fire dragons. You also need a farseer somewhere on the board. And what we're going to start with is the following imaginary scenario. So it's deployment. I have positioned my wave serpent behind a line of sight blocking piece of terrain. I have this imperial ruin here. And ideally, you need to be behind a line of sight blocking piece of terrain that is also breachable. And I think the reason for this is probably already obvious. You want your dragons to be able to move through that piece of terrain, but you want the transport to com be completely out of line of sight of the enemy guns on turn one. And uh, I want to position the wave serpent such that it is within ideally 18 inches of an objective, a midfield objective, 
uh, sometimes you won't be able to do this. You can still you can still kind of make this trick work at like 24 inches, but let's 23 or 22 is better. But we're hoping for 18. Uh, and and what you're trying to do is predict where your opponent's hard targets will be. So against a list that you know is going to rush the midfield, being having this sort of proximity to objectives is the way forward. In some against some opponents. You won't be able to to do this trick on turn one. You'll you'll have to set it up uh, on turn one and then and do it on turn two, maybe even turn three. Uh, but we're going to imagine doing it on turn one. And the reason that we know it's going to work on turn one against this particular opponent is this particular opponent is playing admech, and I am imagining an admech opponent that's running uh, multiple a, a couple of these drill transports these things if you haven't played against these things uh, they're they're horrible they're horrible to face they're uh, Toughness eight. They have a ton of wounds, three up save, and they have like six melta weapons on them, and they hit super hard in melee. So they're they're super tough. They hold, uh, I think, ten infantry. It might even be more than that. Ten infantry, and they have a, a shooting profile equivalent to like three of our warwalkers. If they also had crazy melee, and uh, they're they're only a little bit more expensive than a wave serpent, so they're really good. And they've got a pregame move at the moment, so they can rush the midfield. Now, if you're watching this video, even a few days after I, I put it up, the the drill is not going to have the pregame move anymore. Admech is, their new codex is coming to happen to know that they're losing the pregame move, but they still can deep strike for free. So they're still going to be in the, in, in the midfield probably early and probably being used for objective control. So this is an ideal target for this. Uh, and so I have deployed such that my serpent is out of line of sight, next to breachable terrain. And you want to be very careful when you deploy the serpent to make sure that it is not in the footprint of the building, because if it is in the footprint of the building, suddenly your opponent can see through that obscuring piece of terrain to target the, the serpent, and, and we don't want that. So be, be careful. Probably none of you would make that mistake, but I'm saying it anyway. Keep in mind that you can also, if you're worried about your a savvy opponent uh, seeing where you put your wave serpent, you want to put your wave serpent down last and deploy or, or late if it's full fire dragons. But if you're worried about a savvy opponent, like seeing where you put it and then repositioning appropriately, keep in mind you can always move it with phantasm. So, you know, if if uh, if you're trying to decide which objective to threaten, phantasm is is an option. After you find out who gets first turn, you just decide whether or not you want to you want to move the tank. Okay. So, on turn one. Uh, either in this game that I'm I'm playing, this imaginary game, either I've gotten turn one, but my opponent made a pre-game move onto this objective, which this can currently do, but not for much longer, or, or my opponent had first turn, and this is the bottom of round one, and now I'm taking my turn, and the first thing I'm going to do is have my 10 fire dragons jump out of this wave serpent within three inches of the serpent, and into the breachable terrain. Now, if this were a tournament, I would carefully measure to make sure I got exactly the three inches, and I'm not going to do that right now, partially because I don't want to take the time, and partially because I'm trying really hard not to shake the camera. Some of you have complained about that in video comments on other videos, which I totally get. Uh, and so you, I, I'm, I'm doing this such that you get the idea, but Maybe if I got the tape measure out, I would micromanage exactly where I where I place them. Incidentally, when I shake the camera, it's it's actually the table shaking. I have this really wonderful folding table made specifically for miniature wargaming. And if you're playing on it, you never notice the tremors. But when you when you try to do photography, um, suddenly you realize every time you take a step in the room, it, it quivers. So that's annoying. Okay. Uh, you'll notice that the the Exarc model has that fire pike. It's closest to the camera. Uh, do not assume, based on that, that I think you should have a fire pike. In fact, I think you should not have a fire pike. Fire pikes, obviously, you don't have to do what I think. Do whatever you want. But fire pikes are, uh, I think, really not worth it for the points. Basically, they're just a fusion gun with better range and a melee profile. But you don't want your fire dragons in melee. If that happens, everything's terrible. Uh, except in one very particular kind of build where you turn the fusion guns into pistols using one of the new Exarch powers. And I, I really think that, that that isn't terribly viable for reasons. So don't take the fire bike. My Exarch is modeled with that. When I play competitively, I, I stick in a, a dragon. I designate a different dragon as the Exarch, uh, and I, he just has a fusion gun. It's just not worth the points. Okay. 
So uh, first thing I do on my turn, my fire dragons jump out as far forward as they can get, staying within three inches of the wave serpent. And then I'm gonna make an advance move. Now, I, before the game, I have cleverly uh, swapped out my Exarch power uh, crack shot, which allows the Exarch to reroll ones to hit for um, uh, be, 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 be Swift Step, which is in Phoenix Rising. And what Swift Step does is when the unit advances, it allows them to roll three dice and to take the highest. And this means that you're almost certainly going to get at least one, five, or six. You can always use a command reroll if you need to. Uh, the, sometimes it's still going to be worth using matchless agility. If in order to get within short range of your target with the fusion weapons, such that they get the, the to roll two dice and take the better die, if that requires you to have a 13 inch move, then it's worth spending the one CP on uh, matchless agility, even if you already have swift step. Otherwise, generally you can be, you can be pretty confident you're gonna get the five or six so we'll assume that I have rolled my three dice and I don't get a six, but let's say I get, I get a five on one of them. So they're going to have a 12 inch move and that will easily put me within short range of my target, this big drill. So I'm going to move through the ruin uh, to get within short range with all of my fire dragons. And as I position my fire dragons, I also have to think about where it is I'm going to put this wave serpent because the way this trick works is the wave serpent is now going to move such that it is still out of line of sight of the majority of the enemy's army. It's certainly my enemy's heavy support unit, my opponent's heavy support units, and within seven inches of all of the fire dragons. And so the, the wave serpent is going to move here. Uh, now, off camera, you can't see, but there is actually a big obscuring piece of terrain um, just next to the wave serpent off camera. You'll just have to imagine that it's there. I'm tempted to sort of turn the camera, but I kind of don't trust myself at this point. I've had some issues in the other videos. Uh, do I want to risk it? Nah, nah. So what we're looking at is a bunch of fire dragons within short range of this drill, and all of them close enough to the wave serpent to after they fire, to fire and fade back into the transport, which is out of line of sight of the majority of the, my uh, opponent's units. You'll see there are actually a couple of Catafron uh, destroyers in this building. So it'll, it'll take a little bit of fire, but it, it, it'll be fine. Uh, before my shooting phase, I'm gonna cast Guide on the Fire Dragons. With a Farseer, this is this is not a big ask because the Farseer guide has a 24 inch range. We're in our midfield, so you really don't have to take risks with the Farseer to get it close enough to do this. And theoretically, you should be able to do this without guide, but I want to be absolutely sure that this is going to work. And it's it's just such a bummer, right? You've got 10 dice, you roll the 10 dice, it's a competitive game, and you just really whiff. You just roll a statistically unlikely number of ones and twos. That's horrible. So we're going to use guide just to be absolutely sure uh, that this, that, well, I guess you can never be absolutely sure, but to be absolutely sure that this is overwhelmingly probable. So if I'm rolling 10 dice and hitting on threes, we're going to assume that I hit with seven of them, but then guide will allow me to reroll three of them. And statistically, I should then hit two more times. That'll give me nine hits. Now, these weapons are strength eight. The drill is toughness eight. So let's assume that it goes against me a little bit and I, I wound four out of nine times. But fire dragons have an ability called assured destruction such that they can reroll ones to wound against monsters and vehicles. So it, it's probably a safe bet that I can I can get to five, either I get a slightly better than average dice roll initially or or just average dice roll, uh, or one of those, I get one of those re-rolls and I, I get to five, right? That's what I'm really looking for is five. At this point, uh, I'm rolling 5d6 twice and taking the highest for each individual die. So I, I have to do them individually. Uh, that is gonna be more than enough damage to just completely obliterate this target. And then my fire dragons are going to fire and fade back into the wave serpent. Now I would advise you for the purposes of the video, I have kept everything sort of close together. The wave serpent is pretty close to that objective. So you can see what's going on in general. I think 
you do not want to try to hold an objective with the wave serpent full of fire dragons. I, I, in fact, I think it's a terrible idea. And the reason that it's a terrible idea is that you then make your opponent's decision-making process enormously easy. Uh, if you want to control that objective, grab it with something else. If you grab the objective with the wave serpent full of fire dragons, A, if it's an objective, probably to do that, you, you have to move within the firing solution of your opponent's heavy weapons, at which point they, they can they can light up the wave serpent pretty easily and it will not survive. Uh, the other issue is you are, at that point, your opponent, even if they have to sacrifice position to get a, a, a bead on the wave serpent and, and expose other units in their army, it it's obviously worth doing because it's a, it's a, a five to 10 point swing in terms of primary objective points and they're eliminating one of the most dangerous units in your army. Uh, so suddenly it's a no brainer and a lot of competitive 40 K is about making your opponent make hard choices. So don't, don't give your opponent easy choices, move the wave serpent out of line of sight, take the objective with something else. If your opponent has very mobile units in her army, in many cases, you'll be able to do this and just guarantee that the fire dragons are going to survive to fight again. Uh, if however, your opponent has some some very mobile like maybe you're playing drakari and they can just zoom across the board with their ravagers and light up the wave serpent with a bunch of dark lances even in this situation the fire dragons are going to earn their keep and the reason for that is you, you can make the wave serpent extra durable by putting lightning fast reflexes on it and uh to make it minus one to hit and you've got the serpent shield so all incoming damage is, is, is minus one to the damage. And so it's pretty resource intensive to destroy the wave serpent. If you know that that's coming, you might even cast fortune on it, right? Uh, it's pretty resource intensive to destroy the wave serpent. In fact, it's likely that most opponents won't be able to. And the ones that can with a combination of indirect fire and highly mobile heavy weapons units, the wave serpent will, will suck up all of that fire for a turn. So yeah, maybe you lose the dragons, but uh, they, they eliminated a powerful enemy unit and, and they gave the rest of your army one full turn of respite from, uh, your, your opponent's heavy fire. So even like worst case scenario that happens, uh, it's, it's still well worth it. Well worth the include. Okay. Other reasons that this is good. If on turn, uh, there are certain builds. So, so one advantage to this is the, the high pressure heavy weapons in the midfield, right? So heavy target elimination in the midfield. That's one reason this is good. Um, such that it's safe for your fire dragons, you can do it again. The other reason that this is really good is it gives you a super efficient counter to uh, enemy blitz units, which are usually flyers. So there's, there's certain army lists that include one to two flyers who on turn one will rocket into your deployment zone drop some mortal wound bomb causing bombs on units and then maybe light up some infantry with some heavy bolters or or i don't know whatever drakari have on their void bombers i can't remember uh and and your opponent knows that you will destroy those flyers part of the the, the reason that those flyers are in the list is to do some serious damage on turn one and then to, to force you to commit resources to eliminating them to provide cover for the rest of the army. Well, if you have a normal complement of heavy weapons units and your and your Eldar army, heavy support units, and heavy support is a place where Eldar really shine, then you know you can you can use the fire dragons and the wave serpent to pop out, uh, totally obliterate the flyer. Flyers are usually a little bit fragile. It's super easy to take one out, or maybe even two out. I think ten fire dragons. Quite honestly, some flyers uh, like the Admech flyers really can reasonably hope to eliminate two of them. If you if you split your fire and and maybe use some psychic powers, um, that frees your actual heavy weapons units up to target the stuff that they would have wanted to target anyway. So so this build brings to your army uh, survivable midfield heavy target eliminations, as in the units that are doing the damage are, are, are survivable. The fire dragons, and it gives you this counter to uh, enemy enemy blitz units like flyers, which is which is great. Here's another reason I love this. This build works really well in lists that are not making use of expert crafters. Uh, this means that if you're running Ulthway or Bealtan or you know maybe you're an Eadin player, Eadin player, excuse me, you 
you don't have to feel sad that you don't have access to, to expert crafters. This is a, a, a competitive level tactic that works just as well. And in fact, I think it works best in an Oathway list. I get a, I get a lot of emails from people saying, uh, you know, thanks for the competitive comment c content, but how do I play X craft world? I don't want to run a cu custom craft world. I, I want to run whatever it is my army is painted as. And, and I, I, I admire that and respect that. And, and yes, yes, I think that's great. So this is something that you can, can use to make uh, those, other, those other craft worlds, the traditional craft worlds, more competitive. And the reason that I say that Ulthway particular this, this works particularly well is that most Ulthway lists are running Eldred. And Eldred has three casts in addition to Smite. And his powers are more reliable, so he, he tends to be able to afford, you, you, you can afford to uh, commit more psychic resources because you have more psychic resources. And the, the damage multipliers that the psychic resources provide shine uh, when you have large units. Now, when you're running an expert crafters list, that list is likely to be what's called an MSU list, a minimum sized unit list. So you want minimum sized units of Dark Reapers or Singleton Warwalkers with a couple of Bright Lances where they're, if they're rerolling one hit and one wound, they're probably hitting and wounding with everything. Minimal units of Shining Spears. This stuff really, with expert crafters, really does some work very effectively. But if, if we go back to how Eldar were played before the Phoenix Rising supplement, uh, because they they largely rely on in, in other types of builds, damage multipliers from stratagems and psychic powers, larger units were preferable. And this Fire Dragon build is kind of a throwback to that. And so if you have Eldred in your army, you know, he can cast Guide on them. Maybe he can even also cast Doom on a particularly terrifying target. And he still has a psychic power left to, to cast uh, somewhere else. Also, you get that six up invuln on your wave serpent, you don't have to pay for spirit stones. It's even a little bit more uh, durable. So this is a great option if you're not running expert crafters. So I think this build has a lot of potential. It's it. There, I've never played a game in which this has has let me down. Uh, I'm not saying I you know, uh, including games I have lost. So when when I you know when I when I include this build in my army and I and I nevertheless lose the game. It's never, I, I never think, oh, I wish I hadn't brought the, the fire dragons. They always do good work for me. Here, here are some reasons not to do this. Uh, there's really only one reason not to do this. The, the, the big issue with the fire dragon combo is that it's pretty expensive. Even the minimal wave serpent plus the, the, with the 10 fire dragons in it, even, even if you, you know, no vectored engines, no spirit stones, basic weapons load out, you're looking at 370 points for that block of uh, 10 dragons in the transport that's a lot. That's a big ask. And if you do some math where you, you compare that 370 points to other units, you could have put those points into that, that, have, that fill a similar role, right? That are hard target elimination. You might wonder why you would choose the dragons. I think the best example of this is Warwalkers. They, they are some of the most points efficient hard target elimination, especially in an expert crafter's army, because if you run three singleton Warwalkers, with a, a pair of bright lances each, and you you're you're getting three rerolls to hit and three rerolls to wound, you you're going to hit and wound with most of your dice. Well, that's only quick math here. Let's see, two 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 forty. That's only two hundred and forty points to against three hundred and seventy points, and it it initially might look like it's a similar amount of damage because, yeah, you've got six bright lances instead of ten fusion guns, but with all those rerolls surely the damage is going to work out about the same and they don't require any psychic resources. Well, it's a reasonable question uh, and the, the Warwalkers can deep strike for free, but the damage actually doesn't work out the same because you don't have the roll two dice take the higher at close range. And if you do put just minimal psychic resources into the Fire Dragons, even just that one guide cast, and you take into account that they, that they reroll ones uh, to wound natively, and if you're if you were running them in a crafter's list, they would natively be able to reroll all of their ones in one two. So again, especially against like T seven targets where they're wounding on threes anyway, that's that's super powerful. They really do do more damage more reliably than the three walkers. But you might still say, well, why not just take five walkers? Because for the same amount of points, I could have five walkers. Maybe I run one in a squad of three, I cast Guide on it, and I've got the other two that are just relying on expert crafters. Surely that's more damage. It's 10 dice. It's still not more damage though, because 
uh, of the rerolls that the fusion guns get. And even though the, the war walkers can deep strike for free and they can hit targets at longer range and you can, you can spread out their fire, which is great. Uh, the dragons have an advantage that the walkers don't. And that is that it's easier to keep them alive, right? You, this, if I fire and fade into the wave serpent and it's out of line of sight, I'm much more likely to continue to have that asset for multiple turns than if say I've got the three singleton war walkers deep striking in, I can fire and fade one of them, but, the other ones, my, my opponent, a savvy opponent is likely to prioritize getting rid of those. They're not terribly resource intensive to eliminate unless you get really lucky on that five up invuln. And so, you know, maybe one or two of them stick around to keep blasting things. But they're essentially, if you, if you think of them as a single asset compared to this single asset, they have a declining profile this, as, they, as the individual walkers die. This one doesn't. That doesn't mean that this is better than the walkers. Uh, it's a different tool and it has different strengths and weaknesses. And here's the other advantage to this. You can run a wave serpent filled with fire dragons in a battalion that, that is already making use of all of its heavy support slots. So maybe, maybe you have those three war walkers and an expert crafters list, or maybe it's Ulfway and you've got, uh, I don't know, a unit of three war walkers and some, some other, some other heavy weapons, uh, units. We're not jostling for those precious, the, the Eldar heavy support units are some of the best units available to our army. Those slots can be quite precious. And here we've got a unit that does similar work, but doesn't jostle for those slots. So that's, that's yet another advantage to the Fire Dragons build. Uh, I'm not saying that this belongs in all competitive lists. I'm certainly not saying that a, a list that, that doesn't do this is somehow suboptimal. It's, it's not true. It's, it's one possible competitive tool available to us uh, that is going to be stronger or, or less so depending on what else you're running in your army and, and how you play it and whether it what's in your meta and how it fits your playstyle. But I do think in the vast majority of metas, the vast majority of players can get good use out of this, really enjoy doing it, see instant results on the table. It, it's a little bit finicky with the positioning of the units, but, um, but you, you really, you don't have to be some sort of 40k expert to make this uh, work effectively for you against a wide variety of opponents. I think I think you can have some fun with it and really get some good results. Now, at the beginning of the video, I said that I would talk about two alternative builds uh, for this, and, and I'm going to do that now. And the first one, and they, they both involve running fewer fire dragons, right? One, so one of the disadvantages to this is it's pretty expensive. And you might say to yourself, well, do I really need 10? Maybe maybe if I, if I think eight will probably usually do the same work. And I think that's right. Eight will usually do the same work. Maybe if you need to find some more points in your list, you eliminate two of the fire dragons and you're being less mathematically conservative, but in, in general, it's going to work for you. And maybe it is in fact more optimal. It probably is. I just have, I have a hang up about this. I, I like to run 10. If, however, you take the unit down to seven, now you have an additional tactical option. And that is to put five dire avengers in the wave serpent because a wave serpent can accommodate 12. so if i stick seven fire dragons in i can still fit five dire avengers now i have two additional tools available to me one is an objective control tool and the other is uh an, an infantry elimination tool this can work particularly well when you eliminate a transport, right, and a bunch of infantry pop out of the transport this drill would probably have 10 in it but i'm going to put five down because better illustrates the point I'm making. If I eliminate a transport and a bunch of infantry pop out of the transport, well, if my dire avengers also leapt out of the wave serpent and I and I I successfully blew up the transport with the fire dragons, my opponent is still controlling the objective and there's probably not enough small arms fire plus shuriken cannons on the wave serpent to eliminate even a five man squad reliably, but with five dire avengers especially if the Exarch has two shuriken catapults, especially if he has Shredder, the Exarch power, so he's got four shots at minus three AP. Now, uh, yeah, you can, you can reliably eliminate a five-man infantry unit for sure. Uh, well, ne nothing's for sure in 40K, but extreme, it's extremely likely. It'd be very bad dice indeed. Uh, and, and your Dire Avengers can continue to stand on the objective while your fire dragons jump into the tank, which is out of line of sight. And yeah, maybe your opponent kills the, kills the Avengers, but 
you then then your opponent is assigning resources to prevent you from controlling that objective so those resources aren't assigned elsewhere or maybe your opponent can't quite you know you can you can position them so they survive and they and they score for you and that's great uh, sometimes this will be great uh, the the other advantage is uh, to, to this sort of build is you just leave the dire Avengers in the transport and you use them for late game objective control when the board is a little bit safer there are, there are fewer resources in your opponent's quiver to contest objectives and they can more safely jump onto something and score and that's the way when i do this that's the way i i usually do it uh i will say that the the reason that i personally don't enjoy this one as much is seven fire dragons is exactly the point at which they are it, you're you are merely probably going to destroy the thing uh, and you can no longer count on it. And it, you know, if you have other heavy weapons fire that you can assign, like if the fire dragons don't quite do it, then I'll use this war walker. And if that doesn't quite do it, I have one star cannon on this viper jet. Sure, if you have all that other stuff in your army, maybe you just do that. But uh, I've already established that I have a special horror of of this kind of thing not working. So um, seven is riskier. It might be more optimal, but it is it is riskier. Uh the last, the last build, the Falcon build. Okay, your other option is to just stick six fire dragons and a Falcon, and to give the maybe you give the Falcon a bright lance, because a Falcon with the, the pulse cannon and the bright lance, and six fire dragons in it, hits almost as hard as ten fire dragons, and it's significantly cheaper because the Falcon is cheaper than the Wave Serpent, and we've eliminated four of the fire dragons, and fire dragons are not cheap, so. We, we've just saved ourselves, or, or, or yourself as, as the person planning the list, you just saved yourself a significant number of points. Uh, the thing that I don't love, and I think in 1,000 point play, this is great. The thing that I do not love about this in 2,000 point play is I think in order to make it work, uh, oftentimes you have to give up the very advantage that to my mind makes this worthwhile, and that is the survivability of the fire dragons. And the reason is this. In order to use the, the weapons loadout on the Falcon effectively against the target, you tend to have to position the target, the Falcon, such that it, it will be in the firing solution of a lot of enemy units. Sometimes no, but, but if it shakes out this way, if the only way to get the, to, to get the firepower necessary to eliminate the, the target is to put the Falcon in the line of fire of your opponent's heavy support units, well, now... This is not. This is not going to work. The whole. The whole reason we did this was that it increased the survivability of our fire dragons. That we get to use them multiple times. Uh, that we create a real thorn on our opponent's side. And if our opponent wants to eliminate them, he or she has to devote significant resources. It's just not that hard to destroy a falcon sitting in the middle of the table. It really isn't. Even if you say, "But Brent, for the same points as the wave serpent, I can give the falcon both vectored engines and spirit stones." And I say to you, "But imaginary listener, the math still doesn't work." Work. The Falcon will get destroyed. Everything in it will die. It won't even be that resource intensive for your opponent. You don't have the Serpent Shield reducing all incoming damage. Uh, so I don't. I don't love the Falcon build. I ca I occasionally do it, especially in, in smaller point value play. It's 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 fine. I, and I say this as someone who likes Falcons and thinks they're good. I just think for this for this particular build, um, unless you've got like maybe maybe you have crazy target saturation in the field like there are wraith lords everywhere and other stuff that your opponent might want to shoot even still a savvy opponent's always going to shoot the falcon because a falcon with six fire dragons in it is going to be more dangerous than virtually any other single unit you could have but uh you, it's something to consider you might want to do it i personally like the the 10 fire dragons even though it's quite possible that the seven and five build is more optimal so there you go those are the variant builds available to you. Uh, choose something that fits your play style. I, I would definitely give this a try though, especially if you have some fire dragons sitting in some dusty box marked models I used to like, but now they stink. Uh, fire dragons don't stink anymore. Yay, 2021 ninth edition FAQs. And this is a way to get competitive play out of them. And I think you'll have a lot of fun with it if you give it a try. Okay. So that brings us to the end. Next time I will do that video that I have been promising, uh, part two of Craft Worlds 
list construction. In the meantime, try this trick out in your competitive lists. Also, uh, if you have not already liked this video and commented below, if you did like this video, uh, please consider doing so. It increases traffic and motivates me to make new content. Thanks everybody. I wish you a wonderful night or evening or morning or whatever, whatever it is where you are, and I will see you next time. Oh, and if you've not already been over to craftworldeldar.com to see some other cool Eldari content, you might check it out. Thanks.